Uh, hi everyone, I'm Taina and I was mentored by Josh Achyam. I'm excited to present uh, my scholars project where I engineered a framework that disentangles data containing many behaviors from different experts to learn to steer a model towards one mode of behavior or another. So the internet is chock full of data that many of our machine learning models leverage for training. These data, however, are produced by people, entities, or organizations that have their own utility functions. Uh, they can therefore be thought as being produced conditional on those utility functions. So when our models ingest this large chunk of data wholesale, they tend to assimilate and reproduce these behaviors, uh, of course, that are uh, contained in these utility functions. And as researchers and designers, we may want to retain the ability to steer our trained models towards or away from some modes of behavior. Furthermore, as our models grow in capabilities and are applied to increasingly complex and diverse settings, we may want to steer their behavior to align with the context or human preferences. So with that super ambitious uh, motivation, <laughs> Uh, I'm going to uh, motivate sort of the experimental setup. So our proposed solution looks something like this. In an offline RL setting, we take a, I mean, I took a batch of data and tried to learn from it mode conditional policy. So in the ideal scenario, this single policy that you see on the left um, is Conditional, conditional on the state and some context vector, you know, Z1 through N would correspond exactly to a policy of some expert conditional only on the state. So for example, a pi of A conditional on state N S and Z of N could correspond exactly to pi of expert N. So what is the process for training this model? First, we collect samples, which is straightforward. Uh, we chose to work with samples rather than expert uh, policies because examples of success are easier to come by in nature, uh, especially if we think back to the motivating example of internet data. Then these samples are passed on to a VQVAE um, that is responsible for clustering them. And traditionally, the VQVAE produces discrete labels uh, and then, but in this context, we pass distances uh, instead, uh, which I'll get to in a moment, uh, to a generator, which in this context is a Gaussian MLP actor that will recover a probability distribution uh, conditional on the current state and a proposed cluster label, cluster information. So let's take a closer look at uh, the architecture. Uh, so the first submodel that we have is a VQV uh, inspired by Ord et al. Uh, from 2017 with a small modification. So the VQVAE, as usual, has the objective of distilling its inputs here, uh, which are state transitions, uh, well enough that the decoder can reconstruct and can reconstruct them. In the middle here, uh, you see an embedding space which maps the encoder representations to clusters via a simple argument function. That is, if a, if a tensor is closest in Euclidean distance to embedding tensor J, then map that sample to cluster J. Note that this means that the, di the, the dimensionality of the embedding space determines the maximum total number of clusters you allow the VQVAE to create. If you set K to N, then you can get up to N clusters. I wanna note here that the labels or these, uh, this clustering information is the most essential component here. Uh, where a traditional VQVAE produces discrete labels, instead of these labels, we simply take those distance vectors and, uh, as they contain a richer signal. Now we take these distance vectors and they become the instructions that we send to the generator to tell it how we want it to behave uh, given the state. So now that we've received some um, clustering information, in this case, distances instead of labels from the VQVAE, we concatenate it to the state and pass it through a Gaussian MLP. So from that uh, distribution, we evaluate the probability of the actions that we see in the data taken by the quote unquote expert 
Um, and what happens is we increase the probabilities of the true action under the conditional um, normal distribution. Um, okay, so this is what happens at infant's time. The model observes the state and concatenates a context vector uh, provided by the supervisor, which in this context is me, and then produces a conditional policy and draws an action. Uh, the context vector is this uh, type of vector that we call not hot encoding because the distances uh, are minimized. And so therefore at the, uh, at the correct label index as the model trains these vanished to zero. So let's look at what the training objective looks like in math and then in words. So here's the training objective. Um, if you don't understand what it means, don't worry about it. For those who recognize it, the numerator is the VQ VAE objective and the denominator is just the conditional policy loss. So in words, what was all that math about? So the first term of the, numer the numerator is the reconstruction loss to encourage the encoder and decoder to communicate effectively through good latent representations. Then we have L2 loss from the encoder output that incentivizes the encoder to make representations that are close to the embeddings. And we also have an L2 loss from the decoder output that incentivizes the embeddings to stay close to encoder representation because the embedding space is dimensionless and uh, we wouldn't want it to grow indefinitely. Lastly, in the denominator, as you saw, we had a policy loss, which makes actions more well, comparatively more likely when the clustering algorithm is more confident about the context. And um, this dependency is uh, reflected in the fact that uh, these two models, the MLP and the VQVE, train uh, concurrently. So let's take a look at some demos. So this is the setting we chose for experimentation. It's a continuous control environment that I chose specifically because uh, the expert behavior can be explicitly designed and you can test the quality of context specific imitation. So in this setting, you have an agent in red uh, that lives on this plane where he can navigate to any space using an action vector that selects forward and rotational velocities respectively. Uh, there's a goal uh, that you see uh, there in green that resets to a random location elsewhere on the plane whenever it is reached, and then there's some hazards in purple and a vase, uh, the aquamarine object we can ignore. So here we have two custom design experts. Um, I call them experts because they're just very good at you know, one particular thing. On the left, you have one that is a goal-seeking agent, uh, only cares about pursuing the goal. Uh, and you can see that it has gotten very good at it uh, because on that panel you see in uh, the blue dots are the goals and the various locations that they've uh, respawn when they've been uh, reached and the uh, red dots are the hazards. So I want to emphasize, and on the right, you have a forward moving agent. So I want to emphasize here that in all of these plots that you'll see, um, the setting is exactly the same. It's seated so that the, the placements of the goals, the hazards, et cetera, are exactly the same. So the only thing that we change is the context vector that we feed to the trained model. Okay, so how well does our clustering work? Um, I like to po point out two factors that seem to significantly influence expert behavior uh, in coding in the, in the VQVAE. One is K, uh, which is sort of the number of allowed partitions that you give to the VQVAE. And one is the, the step size, uh, the time step size uh, when calculating state transitions. So here uh, in between transitions, there is a time step of one. And so we can see how uh, as you increase the number of partitions allowed by the VQVAE, it is better able to map different expert behaviors to, uh, to different latent spaces. So with uh, just two or three allowed partitions, it really struggles. And then when you give it four and five, it maps different behaviors uh, to different spots. And here we have a time difference of five in the state transitions. 
And so when we take larger steps to calculate the, the transition, the model seems to learn to cluster much better and faster. So you can make me, maybe think of this as a case where one agent walks forward all the time and the agent walks forward maybe for three steps and then turns. In the one step scenario, the model will have difficulty separating the two agents uh, when they're walking straight for some of the time. A future direction therefore might be to model some long short-term dependencies such as with LSTMs or with attention. Okay. So to refresh your memory, here's what these experts look like in this setting. Um, it looks like I'm running out of time. And so this is what uh, the different modes we gave this, uh, this, this particular model uh, for partition. We said k equals to four. So this is after one epoch of training. And so we map the different modes on the very same environment setup, and they don't look very different. And this is what it looks like after uh, a thousand epics and there's a little bit of differentiation that happens. Uh, one of the modes learns to sweep in wide circles and mode three learns to go in the forward direction. And this is after 5,000 epics, uh, about 2.5 million samples with the very same settings. Um, and now we see that mode two sort of picks up the goal-seeking behavior pretty clearly. And mode three uh, continues to learn, but not perfectly, um, the forward moving behavior. Mode two, one and mode four don't seem to be mapping to anything in particular, or maybe a complex combination of behaviors. So there are so many threads for a future direction um, of this research. As I mentioned earlier, uh, map, mapping or modeling longer term path dependencies like with LSTMs or attention modeling uh, is one that I'm really interested in working with. Uh, I'd also love to be able to ext extract generalizable properties uh, for these types of models as you move from one context to another. Um, and uh, it'd be interesting to look at quantitative performance guarantees. For example, if you have some experts that are bound to hit certain metrics like energy consumption, um, hazard uh, destruction, I uh, wanna make sure that the modes at least approximate those, uh, the modes that they correspond to. And I'd love to then learn how and when to mode switch. You have a model that can learn to mode switch on its own. Uh, from human feedback, other environmental feedback. And I'd love to experiment with different modalities um, and interpretability. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, I would like to thank my mentor, Josh, for his unwavering support throughout this process, uh, OpenAI for this amazing opportunity and um, all the staff for uh, their continuing availability for all my questions and my fellow scholars for their brilliant suggestions and feedback. And now I'd be happy to take some questions. Okay, let's see here. Oops. Sorry. All right. Okay, the question is, right now a limitation for the VQVAE is that when the number of modes is small by comparison to the number of end step behaviors, the model could exhibit and when some end step behaviors could be shared between modes, disentanglement could be quite hard. Uh, what do you think might be interesting to do moving forward for better behavior disentanglement? Yeah, I think that it'd be interesting to look at uh, longer path rollouts and maybe in, including on top of um, some uh, of the discretizing mode of the VQVE, adding some continuous uh, information in the information that the generator sees so that uh, you have a longer context from which to deduce uh, behavior. Uh, I think that is the only question. Um, I would be happy to answer more questions offline and um, I'll be posting my blog post over the weekend as well uh, with more details. Uh, thank you all and I'll pass it back to Christina. <laughs>